the topic is autonomous differential equations. Remember ODE for ordinary differential equations. So at the moment, we're looking at autonomous differential equations with two variables. There's an independent variable, and there's a dependent variable, which is really a function. So what makes a differential equation autonomous is if it's of the form dy dx equals f of x. And the key point here is that even though you have two variables, only the independent variable is showing up on the right-hand side of that equality. So, something like, well, I mean, we looked at an example when we were doing population models, something like dp dt equals k times p times m minus p. Hold on. Is this right? This is not right. This is the opposite of what I wanted to say. Almost the opposite. Um, only the Y is showing up. So here, population is a function of time. I mean, as time changes, the population changes. But this mod model is modding the assumption that the rate the population changes at depends on the current population. So even though population is a function of time, there is no time over here on the right of the equality, only the population. And first order autonomous differential equations are easily studied, even when they're hard to solve. So this is the first example of a differential equation that we can study whether we can solve it or not. And the tool for studying these autonomous differential equations are fixed points. So let's first say what a fixed point is. It's a value of y such that f of y equals zero. And the word fixed in fixed point comes from the fact that if f of y is zero, this derivative is zero. And since the derivative is the rate of change, the derivative being zero means that y isn't changing. It remains at the same fixed value forever. Hence, fixed point. We can use fixed points to study autonomous differential equations. In fact, we did this last Thursday, even though we weren't using that terminology. 
here. Let's see how this works in practice with another population model. So a lot of animals um, have, well, have sort of mating rituals, right? Um, where do those come from? I mean, what's the advantage to having some kind of mating ritual? Well, suppose we don't have anything like that. Suppose a species relies entirely on random, ooh, Zoom is doing this thing where suddenly there's like a half a second input to lag. But suppose a species relies entirely on random meetings between male and female animals for procreation. And let's spend the next few frames and the next few minutes looking at this situation. Um, over the course of a short time frame, how many new births, how many births, I should say, or how many new animals will be born? Let's assume for the sake of simplicity that the population is equal male and female. That's not actually going to affect the mathematics. But, I mean, neglecting sort of trivial things like, you know, some animals are related to each other or in different generations or whatever, there are p over 2 males, and there are p over 2 females. So there are p over 2 times p over 2 ways that a male and a female could interact. Like, if you look at non-related males and females of the same generation, six animals in all in this trivial case, but there are those possible interactions between them. In this case, nine interactions, three times three. Not every interaction will um, result in mating, so we can throw a constant in. This will be the probability that an interaction results in mating. And let's go further. I call this K1. Let's just call it K. The probability that it results in, meet in mating and a successful pregnancy. So the probability that this random interaction brings a new animal into the world. And we could Also, add a constant L, the average litter size.
So the number of new animals that this interaction will bring into the world. And now we can collapse these constants. I mean, we've got a L and we've got a K and we've got a one half and we've got another one half. Um, if we call, take all of those constants, just combine them into one constant, call it M, then over the time, the, um, over this time period, where the time period is maybe the mating season of an animal, we expect m times p squared new animals to be born. There's another way we could approach this problem, which is to say that the number of new animals is going to be the birth rate times the current population. So if the number of new animals is the birth rate times the current population, and the number of new animals is m times p squared, then the birth rate times the current population and m times p squared must be the same. And one of P is positive, we can just, I mean, it's non-zero is the really significant thing. We can just cancel it. And find that our birth rate in this case is just a constant times the current population where that constant is absorbing all of these other constants about litter size and the chances of procreation and the chances of an animal successfully giving birth and all of that stuff. We're just collapsing it into M. So if we now remember, or look up in our notes, as the case may be, the general population model, dp dt equals, the birth rate goes here, we decided that the birth rate must be m times p, minus the death rate. We are holding the death rate constant for simplicity. There's our differential equation. And we could pull an m out, and let's write this p up front. And this differential equation is similar to, but different from, the logistic differential equation. The logistic differential equation <coughs> had the m and the p, the constant and the population, reversed. In the logistic case, the population was on the right of that subtraction. In this case, the population is on the left of the subtraction. And this is an autonomous differential equation. You'll notice that there is no time variable t over here on the right. The population is changing as time passes, but time is not explicitly being referenced. And this
this autonomous differential equation has fixed points. Fixed points are found by setting the differential equation equal to zero. There are two fixed points here. Zero is a fixed point and delta over m is a fixed point. We are using the zero product property. If this product is zero, then either this is zero or this is zero. And from that, we get two fixed points. And my claim, and we did this for the, um, for the logistic model before we solved it, my claim is that we can understand this population model without going through the effort of solving it. I mean, we can understand it in at least broad strokes. Because let's look at the population. There are two fixed points here. Zero is a fixed point, and um, this delta over m is a fixed point. And in practice, of course, the population can't actually be less than zero. Um, what happens if the population is kind of small? What happens if the population is in there? Well, if the population is in this region, then the population is less than delta over m. What's that do? Now, if the population is less than delta over m, that term up here is negative. So we have a negative term times a positive term. The population is positive. And if we have a negative term times a positive term, that's a negative number. So in this region, the derivative is negative. And if the derivative is negative, that means the function is decreasing. So the population is decreasing with time. As time passes, the population goes down. So from the animal population's point of view, this is a dire situation because zero animals represent extinction. So if there's a relatively small animal population to begin with, they will not thrive. The population will just keep decreasing until the animals go extinct. But what if, what if the population is initially big? Well, in that case, we see the reverse of this. 
if the population is greater than delta over m, then this is positive, and this is positive, and a positive number times a positive number is positive. So, if the population is initially large, the derivative is positive, and the population is growing. And that's not a good thing either. I mean, I guess from the point of view of the animal species, it's a good thing. But if the animal population grows without bound, then what about the other? species that are in that same habitat and trying to compete for resources or being preyed upon by this species, they won't have any room to compete if this animal population just grows to infinity as time passes. So neither of these is good. I mean, obviously, putting sort of moral, uh, moral tinges on a natural process, but if you think that we should have multiple species coexisting in the same environment, then neither of these is okay. This if the population is initially small, will just lead to extinction. This, if the population is initially large, will lead to the destruction of the environment. So, ecologically speaking, it is not a good thing to have this situation where just random interactions between animals drives procreation. There ought to be something else involved to prevent this sort of catastrophic situation we're seeing here from occurring. And again, the point I want, I mean, this is the end, first of all, it's the end of the last section, but the point we want to make is that we did this analysis without solving the differential equation. Um, so, this sort of fixed point analysis is what I'll call it. We can do this with any autonomous differential equation. I mean, it might be hard as far as finding the fixed points. Maybe we'll need some kind of... I seem to be messing around at random. Here we go. As far as finding the fixed points, maybe we'll need to use a computer algorithm because we have some complicated expression and we can't solve it by hand. But this basic analysis works for any autonomous differential equation. Find the fixed points, between the fixed points, it will either always be positive or always be negative. And then you can see what happens for any initial value. Our initial population is up here. It's exploding to infinity. Our initial population is down here. It's going down to extinction. So we can analyze autonomous differential equations in this manner. 
I, by the way, um, I mean, I used a little common sense. I just ignored the part of the number line where the population was negative. I mean, you have to have to apply a little thought here. Can't have a negative animal population. Let's compare this to the logistic model. The logistic model, I mean, this is in your notes, I wasn't using the word fixed points, but the logistic model also has two fixed points one at extinction and one at carrying capacity. And the model we just looked at has, this isn't zero, let me just call it uh, M. And the model we just looked at also has two fixed points, one at zero, again, let's just call the second fixed point M. So in those terms, these models look similar, but what happened between the fixed points was different. Uh, the book, I don't know if this is standard terminology, but it calls the model we just looked at the doomsday model because there are no good outcomes. Let's look at this M in both models. In this model, if we start close to M, the model brings us to M. In this model, if we start close to M, the model takes us further away from M. This is going to give us a major, well, a major set of definitions um, known as the stability types of a fixed point. A fixed point is unstable if There are initial, this is going to be stated a little informally, but if there are initial values near fi the fixed point, that leave the neighborhood of the fixed point. So let's go back, well, that's actually just do a new frame, logistic model, let's say, or let's not even have a population model. Let's just say we have these fixed points. We're not putting any real world meaning on the differential equation. But maybe we <coughs> find that between the fixed points, the derivative is positive. And to the right, 
of that fixed point, the derivative is positive, and to the left of this fixed point, the derivative is negative. Both of these fixed points are unstable. Because let's say, let's say we're here. So we're starting really close to this fixed point. Well, we start close to the fixed point, but the derivative is positive. So we just start moving to the right. And as we move to the right, we get further and further away from the fixed point. So this is an unstable fixed point. Um, the reason my terminology on the last frame was a little contorted, right? If there are initial values. What I was trying to get at See if I, I cannot erase it without erasing the entire number line. Let's get that back again. Let's say we start near the fixed point, but to the left of the fixed point. Well, this initial condition won't move away from the fixed point. Here, the derivative is positive, everything's going right, so this initial condition will just get closer and closer to the fixed point. So I'm not saying that every initial condition has to go away, but if there are initial conditions that go away from it, that's enough to make the fixed point unstable. We do, in the two in the one-dimensional number line, I mean, first of all, that we kind of, in terms of these arrow pictures I've been drawing, If we have a fixed point, then there are three ways to be unstable. That's unstable. That's unstable. That's unstable. All of these are unstable. Stable. So the opposite of instability is stability, but there's actually some awkward terminology going on here. A fixed point that is not unstable is stable. So that is probably pretty natural sounding. The issue is that there's a third definition. If a fixed point is stable and all the initial conditions 
near the fixed point. Converge to the fixed point. That fixed point is called asymptotically stable. And the thing, like if you are the type of student who goes online and looks for other resources, I mean, that's great. But the thing you need to be aware of is that there are resources that confuse asymptotic stability and stability. So there are resources that say stable when what they really mean is asymptotically stable. And in this, in this one-dimensional case where we just have these number lines, you can kind of forgive people for sort of mixing these concepts together. Because I mean, in terms of these number lines, asymptotic stability looks like this. And if you ask me to, if, okay, can you give an example of a dif differential equation that is stable without being asymptotically stable? It's really awkward to do on the number. I mean, most of the examples where we are asympt where we are stable without being asymptotically stable are going to show up once we move to higher dimensions. Because on the plane, on the plane, it's easy. If we're now in two-dimensional space, imagine that we have a fixed point and we have trajectories that orbit the fixed point. There's an example of a fixed point that is stable, but not asymptotically stable. If we start near the fixed point, we stay near the fixed point, but we don't converge to the fixed point. So this distinction between stability and asymptotic stability is going to be really important later in the class. It's less important with in this section, where all of the fixed points we look at are going to be either unstable or asymptotically stable. One last definition related to this. Fixed points of this form are sometimes called semi-stable. And I hate this terminology because it gives students completely the wrong idea. I mean, the way this terminology makes it sound is that you have unstable points and stable points and then sort of half stable points between those extremes. And that is an incorrect, um, incorrect 
thought process, an incorrect way of viewing these fixed points. Semi-stable fixed points are unstable. They're just a special kind of unstable. Maybe, maybe the closest analog would be calculus where you might write the limit as x approaches c of a function does not exist, or you might write the limit as x approaches c of a function equals infinity. And you're writing different things, but if the limit is infinity, the limit doesn't exist. So this down here is really just a special case of this up here. Same thing with this semi-stability. Semi-stable fixed points are a special case of unstable fixed points. Now, to understand the importance importance of these definitions, we need to try to take this and put it into some kind of real-world context. And the real-world context we want is that asymptotically Stable fixed points can appear in the real world. And let's try to understand this statement in terms of our population models. Let's look at our logistic population model, where we've got extinction. Extinction is an unstable fixed point in the logistic model. And we've got our carrying capacity. Our carrying capacity is asymptotically stable. And let's think about what this model is saying versus reality. According to this model, carrying capacity is a fixed. So, say we have a carrying capacity of 2,000 animals. According to this model, if we have a, exactly 2,000 animals, the derivative will be zero and will just stay on this fixed point forever. There will always be exactly 2,000 animals. Well, of course, we recognize that that's nothing like reality. I mean, in reality, we're going to see all kinds of random forces buffet this animal population. Maybe there's an unusually harsh winter. Maybe there's a disease. Maybe there's an unusually pleasant spring. There are all of these outside factors that are not in the logistic model that are going to be affecting this animal population. So let's say we have 2,000 animals. There's an unusually harsh winter. It's not in our model. Our model can't really deal with it. And this unusually harsh winter causes our population to drop. 
Well, because this fixed point is asymptotically stable, our population drops due to this winter, but then as time passes, our population grows again. It once again reaches that fixed point. An unusual, another spring, there's an unusual amount of resources, a few more animals are born than usual, and the population jumps a bit. But then conditions return to normal, you see the derivative is negative, the animal population goes back down again. So if random fluctuations take the animal population off of this fixed point, they either increase the population or decrease the population, then what we're predicting is that as time passes, the population will go back to the fixed so in the real world, we expect to see the animal population hovering around 2,000. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but always hovering in that area. Compare that to the unstable fixed point. of the doomsday model. We still have a fixed point here. Maybe this fixed point is sitting at 2,000 once again. So according to this model, our fixed point could be 2,000, and it could stay 2,000 forever. But what happens when any kind of outside factors come into play? There's an unusually harsh winter. The animal population drops. And the dynamics of this model mean that once the animal population has dropped, it has no way of recovering. Once the animal population gets too small, the dynamics of this model bring the animal population down to zero. Or if the animal population somehow gets too big, the dynamics of this model cause it to explode up to infinity. So this isn't a fixed point we could see in the real world because the real world is chaotic and messy and has all sorts of ooh, all sorts of things that aren't in the model and once those things come into play and drive the animal population off of that fixed point it does not come back to that fixed Um, so asymptotically stable fixed points are fixed points you can see in the real world. Um, going, keeping with this model, this model does have an asymptotically stable fixed point. Unfortunately for the animals, that asymptotically stable fixed point of course, there can't really be negative populations, but that's what the diagram looks like. That asymptotically stable fixed point is extinction. Um, animals 
If the animal population is initially low, it can't recover, it stays low, and it converges towards extinction. A few more definitions. I don't know that, that this next definition is in the book, but it's a really important one. A differential equation is structurally stable if small changes in parameters do not change the overall behavior of the model. I'm going to, to briefly pause. So this is an informally stated definition, but um, but the basic idea we should be able to explain, I mean, look at, look way back at this population model. Um, we have this constant M that appears in this model, and this m then appears in the differential equation twice. Now, in reality, you do not know what m is. That's another thing I don't necessarily love about some of the textbook problems where they're like, well, you have all of this data, find the model, find all of these constants. I mean, M is some kind of amalgamation of the ratio of the population that is male and the ratio of the population that is female and the probabilities of animals meeting and the probability of you know, animal was successfully breeding, and the litter size, and the probability that the animals don't die when, you know, they're just a month old or whatever. In reality, M is taking so many things and smushing them together into one number that it's really hard to say, you know, M is this. M is 2.7. It's not 2.65, it's not 2.73, M is 2.7. This model really doesn't allow for that degree of specificity. Well, fortunately, it doesn't really matter. I mean, whether, let me... Suddenly my, ah, uh, uh, sorry, fighting with, there, we're just looking at this model. So no matter what 
M is, whether it's 2.7 or 4.9 or 3.1, you're always going to see the same basic behavior. If the population is initially small, it goes extinct. If the population is initially large, it grows and overwhelms the environment. And that's what I mean when I say, come on, that's what I mean when I say that small changes in parameters aren't affected the overall behavior of the model. I mean, it changes our threshold of what we mean by small and what we mean by big, but changing M doesn't really fundamentally change the model. That death rate also, I mean, Delta, we're claiming we have a constant death rate, that's nonsense, right? I mean, a, any sort of constant death rate is really just an average. The death rate is usually around this. It doesn't make sense to say that delta is exactly two. But again, it doesn't really matter if delta is 2 or 2.7 or 1.8. It's not affecting the basic behavior of the model. So all, all real-world differential equations, if we're trying to study a real-world situation using differential equations, the model needs some kind of structural stability problem. Because, I mean, even in physics and engineering, you know, maybe we have really specific constants, but they're still rounded to five decimal places or whatever. They're still not exact. Let's end with another definition, I think. Yeah, this one should be in your textbook. And at first blush, this is going to seem like kind of the opposite of structural stability. A bifurcation occurs when a change in parameter value abruptly causes a change in the fixed point. And by a change in the fixed points, I mean a serious change in the fixed points. It changes the number of fixed points, or it changes the stability of the fixed points. And because that, just because it's so nice and kind of easy to work with, let's keep with population models and let's demonstrate this via an example. And zoom has a 20 frame limit. So let's go back to the beginning. And let's look at dp dt equals ap minus bp squared minus h. This is almost the logistic model. 
If you did not have that H, it would be the logistic model. So this is the logistic model with harvesting. And I mean the most literal example of this would be a fishery where you literally harvest the fish. But you could also think of this as a forest. And there are elk in the forest, and there are so many people with hunting licenses who are allowed to kill and remove an elk every season. So we've got kind of the AP minus BP squared. That's just nature doing its thing. And then we have this harvesting term, which is humans, us, going in and removing animals. So in this context, A and B are presumably fixed. We can't really adjust the birth rates. We probably can't really adjust the natural death rates. But we can certainly adjust the rate at which we harvest animals. The number of hunting licenses we give out, the number of fish we allow companies to haul in, stuff like that. And this is an autonomous differential equation. You'll notice that time variable is not appearing on the right. So let's, let's draw the number line. And because I think this is probably the easiest way to do this, here's the number line. It's the population. Let's fill in the Cartesian plane. And let's look at this derivative. AP minus BP squared minus H. Um, let's also note, again, you sometimes have to use kind of common sense together with mathematics. Um, extinction is not a fixed point of this mathematical model. Because according to this model, even, once the, even if the animal was driven extinct, you'll keep harvesting it. I mean, obviously that is not true. You again just have to use a little common sense here. This AP minus BP squared minus H is a quadratic. And if H is large enough, this quadratic will be totally down there. Well, if the quadratic is always below the, the axis, always below the x-axis, the quadratic is negative. So the derivative is always negative. And if the derivative is always negative, the population is always decreasing. So there are no fixed points here um, because this quadratic is never equal to zero. It's always below the axis. There are no fixed points. The population just decreases. Our model says it just keeps decreasing forever. We obviously understand that it's decreasing towards extinction. This is when H is large. 
and now college algebra, H is a vertical shift. H being large is a large vertical shift. It's what took this quadratic and put it down here. If we decrease H, this quadratic is going to shift up. So we decrease h, and we decrease h, and as we decrease h, this quadratic is pulled up, and eventually this quadratic is pulled up enough so that the quadratic equals zero at one point. And when the quadratic equals zero, that's a fixed point. So a fixed point has suddenly appeared from increasing h. And this fixed point is unstable. It's semi-stable, but semi-stability is a type of instability. The picture now looks like this. And going back to what I said about stuff, you know, asymptotically stable fixed points appearing in the real world, unstable fixed points not appearing in the real world. That goes for this, too. I mean, the fact that it's semi-stable, it's still unstable. And if you try to maintain this level of harvesting, you are putting yourself in an incredibly precarious situation. The population will stay red on pink. The population, according to the model, can just stay here. But if anything ever happens that causes the population to shrink, then the population will go down to zero. So, again, this is unstable. Don't be fooled. Semi-stable isn't like halfway between the two. It's unstable, and it's a fixed point that you can't expect to see in nature. The first time there's a harsh winter or an outbreak of any kind of sickness, you've lost your fishery. So as h decreases, this quadratic is being pulled up. If we decrease h any further, then now our quadratic is equal to 0 twice, and we have two fixed points. And of these fixed points, here's our diagram. One of these fixed points is asymptotically stable. It's something that you can expect to see in nature. So at this level of harvesting, we can maintain in this animal population, this number of fish or elk or whatever they are. And if we get a little below it, it's fine. We'll come back to it. It won't cause extinction. Likewise, if we get a little above it, it will come back to it. It won't cause overcrowding. So this happened, I mean, there was a threshold of H here, where if H is less 
than that threshold, there were no fixed points. And if h is equal to that threshold, there was one unstable fixed point. And if h is greater than the threshold, there are two fixed points. One of them is asymptotically stable, the other is unstable. And we don't think of this, we don't think of this as being structural instability. Because we're really think, not thinking of H as a constant here. Remember that structural stability is when small changes in the constants don't mess with the model. We're not thinking of H as a constant. We're thinking of H as a parameter that we can adjust year after year. So, essentially, h is a third variable, albeit one that's not appearing in any of the diff- I mean, it's, they're not taking derivatives with respect to it or anything like that. That brings us right to time. Um, so... So oh, yeah, there's a homework assignment on this section. Use finding fixed points, using fixed points to figure out what's happening to a system. And we'll, on Thursday, we'll look at um, velocity with air resistance. And we'll use some of this fixed point stuff to analyze velocity equations.